what is central to us? What's our common denominator? What, what pulls us together more than anything else? Well, someone could say Christ. Yes, that is true. But I would submit that we need to be more specific than that. And I would say the cross of Calvary is a central point for all of us. I know his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, all of that goes together. Because if he had not died, he would not have been buried. If he had not been buried, he would not have been raised. If he had not been raised, he wouldn't have been ascended. But we serve a Lord that is victorious. God did not create death. But death is on us because of the judgment of our rebellion against God. And that judgment stands, and every one of us, one day, will die. Now, for those that are born-again Christians, that's not a negative statement. It's a positive statement, because we get to go home and be with the Lord. We know our destination. There are so many people today that are so concerned about death. The reason why they don't want to get COVID is because so many have died, over 500,000 that have died from COVID. And so they're afraid of death. I know people that don't want to walk through a cemetery at night. It's full of all kinds of superstition about death. The Bible is plain. The Bible is clear for us exactly what happens at death. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? And so I look forward to being present with the Lord, and I don't fear death. Now, going through the door to get to death, that might be a, a, a challenge for all of us. But today, I'm going to look at three men with you. And it's no coincidence that there were two malefactors that were crucified with Jesus. There's a tremendous lesson there, not only from that text and that passage in Luke chapter 23, but they're also recorded in Matthew and in Mark. And uh, so we want to look at that today, and we want to examine what is revealed right there at the cross. As we look at this scene, 
of the cross. There were those there accusing, those there guarding, those there in grief and sorrow, broken. What a scene that really was. I take you now to Luke chapter 23. I want us to begin with verse 33 of this 23rd chapter. I want us to look at the death of these three men that died that day on Calvary. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment, his clothing, and they cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he be this, the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. And say, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, Do you not know and fear God seeing that thou art in the same condemnation and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds but this man hath done nothing amiss and he said unto Jesus Lord remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom and Jesus said unto him verily I say unto you today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, and Jesus died on the cross. As we look at these three men, I want it to be a reminder to every one of us in this room today that every one of us face death. For some of you, that will be a joyous experience. There may be someone here today that dreads death, that looks at it as such a negative, such an awful thing, that they can't stand the thought that they're going to have to face death. I think we can examine that in these three men. The first man I've depicted here on the left-hand side of this picture. He is riling against, angry against Jesus. And he is making accusation. If you're so great, save us. That was his solution to it. It was very selfish. It was all about him. Uh, what can you do for me? How can you help me? You know, there are those that come around the church. <laughs> And they're looking to see what the church can do for them. They're not looking to give anything. They just want to get something. There are people that go through their life with this selfish kind of viewpoint. Here is a marriage partner in their life and they're taking instead of giving. And that person lives in the fear and the dread of the attitudes and the actions of this other person. There are people that live selfish lives. You've had to work with some of them. You've had to live next to or near some of them. They're thinking about themselves. And any time that they're coming around you, you think, okay, what do they want now? They've always got their hand out. They're always wanting what they need. And they never give a thought to anyone else. Here is this man that 
Who knows what his criminal acts were? Murder, sedition, lying, cheating, stealing, uh, you name it. He's guilty of it. He knows it. But he thinks that he is such a wonderful person that there needs to be no judgment upon him. Nobody needs to point a finger at me. People like that tend to point fingers at other people instead of having anyone point a finger at them. Nobody wants to admit they're like this man. I want to tell you something, though. I was very much like this man. 18 years of my life. And uh, as a college student, I had a roommate named Tom Sperlin, a, a, a music major. And... Uh, he lived for the Lord. I mean, everything about him, every opportunity he had, he talked about Jesus. He sang about Jesus. He's in the shower, showering in there, and praise the Lord, and he's singing and all these songs. And uh, he, started, he was going to a Bible study, and he invited me to that Bible study. And I went, first time out of curiosity, and second time because they had some cute girls over there. I'm just being honest. <laughs> but there at that Bible study, they opened up the Bible and they read it and they studied it like they believed it. When they sang songs, it was like they were singing to Jesus personally. I, I'd grown up in church, but I'd never experienced anything like that. It, it wasn't religion. It wasn't distant. It wasn't out there. It was right here. These young people were living for the Lord. They were dynamic in the fact that the Spirit of God was alive and well and working in their hearts and lives. And it's there that I came under conviction. Yes, I was a church member. Yes, I'd been baptized, sprinkled. But I didn't know Jesus. I didn't have a personal relationship to Him. I'd never thought of Jesus and shed a tear. I'd never prayed and felt like I was actually talking to someone. This man was living a self-contained life. Something needed to break through. And even being crucified on a cross and knowing that within hours he was going to be dead... He still was riling against Jesus and making accusations against Jesus. But then to the right here in this picture, I have sought to depict another man who rebuked this first man and said, we deserve what we're getting. You know what you've done. You know what I've done. We deserve this. But this man is innocent. This man has done no wrong. And yet Jesus was there on that cross, not because of what he did, but because of what I have done and what you have done and what every man and woman that rebels against the will of God has done. I want my way. I want to go my direction. I want to do my thing. And here this man sees innocence, and he declares it. And now, hanging on a cross in agony and in pain, he turns to Jesus, and what does he say? Lord, Lord. When you're saying Lord in the way that he used it, you're saying, you are my God. You are my God. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I know that from this cross you're going to go into the presence of your heavenly Father. I recognize that. I recognize my condition. I'm a sinner. I deserve what I'm getting, but you don't. So I'm trusting in you. Now you can examine this man's words. He could have said all kinds of things. What he's actually and simply doing is he's confessing 
Jesus as Savior and Lord. That's what every one of us has to do to be born again. I can say personally, there was such a great difference in my life from being a churchgoer to being saved by Jesus. The new birth changed me radically, totally. Now, did I become perfect? I still haven't got that achieved. I'm a long ways from perfect. But I'll tell you this, I am a long ways from where Jesus found me and picked me up and saved me. Can you say that? You see, here is a man that deserved death. Here is a person that was doing wrong. And Jesus, even on the cross, didn't give him the plan of salvation, didn't go through a long sermon, didn't go through all of that. He simply was innocent and taking the punishment for us all. And anyone can look at the cross and be drawn to that cross because we know God died for us. Now, this first man died in sin. This second man died to sin. What a difference. You can die to sin. You can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And as you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can die to sin yourself. Not that you become sinless, but you become very conscious of the pleasure of God, of displeasing Him. You start thinking of others instead of yourself. And it gives you a whole new perspective in life. You see... Here is one that died in sin, one that died to sin, but Jesus there died for sin. There on Calvary's cross, he gives his life, and uh, as he gives his life, he is paying a price for us. 1 Corinthians 15.3 is a good expression of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Paul gives it here. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. When you look at the prophecies of old, they said one that was coming was going to take care of the sin problem. He was going to be the Messiah, the anointed one, that special one of God that would come and enter into human history and everything would be changed. I also like 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became our sin bearer. He gave us His righteousness. We gave Him our sin. Here's what Jesus was pleading for. Every miracle, every teaching, everything that He did in that short three-year span was designed to help us understand and see God loved us so much that Jesus came, entered into human flesh, incarnate so that he could take all of our excuses away and he could live where we're living, face what we're facing without sin so that he could be the perfect sacrifice. In the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, it gives all kinds of rules about what you can offer as a sacrifice. If you offered a little lamb, it had to be less than a year old. It could not have any blemishes, broken legs, uh, deformed ears, one eye, sickly, going to die anyway. It had to be a healthy, robust animal. It had to pass inspection and be offered to God as a sacrifice. A sacrifice that recognized, I have sinned. Here we do not offer lambs for sacrifice. You all don't do that here, do you, Brother Parker? 
You see, we don't have a place out here where we kill a lamb and take its blood and come and sprinkle it on the altar so that we can be reminded of how awful sin is and how much we need a blood atonement. But God, in His great and infinite wisdom, was pointing to that sacrifice that would have to come at some point in history. And here in this point in history, God says, this is how much I love you. This is the length to which I will go. You cannot go any farther. He gave his life that we might have life. So here is this contrast. It's no accident that there were three crosses. It's no accident that there were two malefactors there, both criminals, both crooks, both very despicable men. One hated, despised to his last breath, and one God was able to change. If that criminal on that cross could be saved and go with Jesus to paradise that day, It opens the way for anybody like me or anybody like you that we can see that without any excuse we can bring our sin, whatever it is, and He'll forgive it. He'll come into your heart. He'll come into your life and He'll change you. He'll make a new person out of you. No, you won't be perfect. You'll still have a sinful nature. You'll still go through that struggle of sanctification. That is trying to set apart that part, those parts of our lives that will give honor and glory to Jesus Christ. But then there's that sin that is there and that, that's ever present pulling against the good that we would do. Paul says in Romans 7 that he was in a tug of war. A tug of war within himself of doing what was right or doing what was wrong. And he says, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? And he answers his own question, the Lord Jesus Christ, he alone can do that. And here we see these three men. Could we dare to put ourselves in the place of saying, where am I? Where am I? Like this first man, am I living selfishly, self-absorbed, self-focused, selfish? Or have I come to the place in my life, a definite point in which I've said, I recognize Jesus Christ as Lord. The one and the only one that can come into my heart and come into my life and save me and give me a new life and bring the help that I desperate.